Okay, hello and welcome to day two of the Mental Health Equity is Health Equity Speaker Symposium. For those of our participants who could not join us yesterday and are joining us new today, which we have several from across the world, I'm thrilled. My name is Madhuri Jha and I am the director for the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity, an entity of Satcher Health Leadership Institute here at Morehouse School of Medicine. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you back to our exciting forum. I extend gratitude again to the APA Foundation for sponsoring our event. Yesterday, our speakers took us through an important journey on discussions on policy and data and clinical service delivery in the equity landscape. One of my biggest takeaways was the power of community. Despite this being virtual, the community felt amongst all of our hundreds of participants and our speakers is truly being felt. Thank you so much for your energy. Today, our focus is on cultural humility and sensitivity and what the movement can do to uplift the voices of the invisible. Today's format will be a little bit different from yesterday. We will have a panel discussion followed by two keynote speaker presentations who I am excited to introduce you to a little bit later. As I said yesterday, our speakers represent a diverse and unique set of voices in the field. While they are all leaders and experts, they are all also people with lived experience. I am excited that you will be able to witness another unique meeting of the minds. Again, due to the volume of registrants we have logged into this Zoom, we have turned off the public chat and Q&A function during our event. However, you can privately contact our team in the chat if you would like to see a question be asked of our panelists. We will do our best to feature audience questions that we see are coming up with frequency. Without further ado, it is my distinct honor to reintroduce you to the co-founder of the, P the Kennedy Satcher Center, former Congressman Patrick J. Kennedy, and our president and dean here at Morehouse School of Medicine, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, who will kick us off with some welcome remarks. We will then share a video featuring Shirley McRae, First Lady of New York City, and a longtime champion for mental health. Following their remarks, there will be a short break to set up our panelists and begin the first panel of the day. Thank you. Lori, do you want me to go first? Yes, go ahead. All right. Well, I appreciate all that you've done to pull this terrific uh, webinar together. And what a great day yesterday was, as you point out. Uh, it really put forth terrific uh, concepts as to where we need to go policy-wise and also how data needs to be evaluated so that it can really drive um, those policy changes, understanding the data and how we measure um, really can affect what gets paid for and then what gets sustained. Um, I really, really loved uh, all the comments about community. Your takeaway, Madhuri, was exactly mine. And it really recalled for me um, how powerful uh, my uncle President Kennedy's uh, signing ceremony was for the Community Mental Health Act back in 1963. And he said uh, that essentially uh, people with mental illness need no longer be alien to our affections or beyond the help of our community. To yesterday's point, the community is where you assess strengths. You don't just um, treat diagnoses. You have to look at the opportunity to enhance what people have available to them. And if you don't have supportive housing, if you have huge economic disparities that preclude people from having access to teletherapy, all of those things dramatically impact what we uh, consider as chronic care management. And, and as everyone said yesterday, our system is acute disease management, but not really chronic care management. We have to rethink our whole approach so that we don't take the medical model and over uh, prescribe it to, to a chronic uh, illness situation that is driven, as many said yesterday, by social determinants of health, or as my good friend Daniel Dawes says, political determinants of health, because as a nation, we've really uh, made those decisions to treat people with mental illness as second-class citizens, to treat people of color as second-class citizens, to really marginalize those who are disenfranchised already so today's uh, panel is going to be 
uh, terrific. I, I love the talk yesterday about not treating people as part of monolithic groups because we all have our own stories to tell. And that should be the basis of the way therapy is, uh, is conducted. I think that what we learn also from advocates today is that all of these lessons, and I, I really appreciate you, what you said, Madhuri, about the fact that this, this meeting here is really the beginning of a conversation that, as Dr. Rice and I have discussed, can really move forward on, on a lot of different levels. Because yesterday there was a great deal of talk about how to leverage you know, our church community to advance mental health, our education system to advance mental health, how to correct um, the kind of punitive approaches in, 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 inherent in our justice-involved population as they consider mental health. Um, but the exciting thing is, is that we're having these conversations. And uh, that, I think, is really the hope for the future, is that we can put those policies in place if we understand what those policies should look like, and then we can advocate that they move forward. So with that, I want to thank Dr. Rice and, and Morehouse School of Medicine and my good friend, Dr. Satcher, and, and everybody that's been responsible for helping to put all of this together, the APA Foundation and Dr. Saul Levin. This is an exciting time and, and uh, hope everybody stays engaged with uh, the work that we're starting here. And, and again, celebrate and thank everybody who's been part of helping us better uh, develop policy and a direction forward. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to my good friend, uh, Dr. Montgomery Rice, and thank her for her leadership. Thank you, Patrick. It is such a honor for me to uh, be able to speak to this group and to say how amazed I am that 10 years ago, we officially launched the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity at Morehouse School of Medicine. What we knew then and continues to be true that there's no health without mental health. You gotta have your mental well being. And so when I think about today's session on cultural humility and sensitivity, I am brought back to a time for me when I was in the seventh grade. And Mrs. Betty Davis, my seventh grade teacher, I had been selected in Macon, Georgia to be the valedictorian. And she would essentially write your speech. But she made you come after school and you had to practice it over and over again. And she said to me, first of all, you need to learn the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. I had no idea what she was really talking about in the seventh grade. And then she said to me, and this is when they could have a ruler and they could tap your hand, you know, that, that was a long time ago, guys. You can't do that now. But she said, when I spoke about being humble and the word humble, she said, you don't say it with enough humility. You got to learn how to say it with humility because you're going to need that as you move along. And she was right. Because as I became a healthcare professional, and have had the honor to care for people. I've used this phrase often. When a patient or someone is sitting across from me, I ask a simple question based on who's sitting in front of me, what's possible? And in order to really answer that question, you got to think about the wholeness of that person. You got to think about their background. You got to ask questions about their family, what their living conditions are. You got to ask questions about their mental well being and their physical well being before you write that prescription because that patient may not need a new medication that day. They may need one of those social determinants that needs to be addressed in order to really be able to allow them to achieve health equity. We're at a real trajectory and a really a point in this 
country where we are moving toward whether we want to or not to a place that doesn't seem to always embrace with the level of sensitivity and humility, the whole person. We're trying to heal as a nation, not just from COVID-19 and this global pandemic, but from the racial, social, and cultural divide that has been really shown and showcased because of this pandemic. We will not be able to heal until we acknowledge and address with both humility and sensitivity, the continued role of structural racism and divisive and divisive politics that fosters differences and opportunities, access and outcomes for marginalized populations. All of that and more leads to substance abuse. All of that and more leads to depression and other mental illness. What I know that we can do here at Morehouse School of Medicine through this Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity is to have these significant conversations in a very authentic way that brings together each of us with our cognitive diversity, our life experiences that have allowed us to combine that with our pedagogy and be able to educate and train the next generation. And we do it, and if we do it, with humility and sensitivity, we will see a change. We will see health equity achieved. And people will begin to appreciate that no matter what your wealth and no matter what your physical health, if your mental well-being is not intact, then health equity is not achieved. So I am excited about what happened on yesterday. And I'm equally excited about what the panelists are going to bring forth today. This is the work that needs to be done. And I applaud you all and everyone who's joined in for understanding based on the circumstances that we couldn't do it in person, that we needed to do it virtually, but that the work did not need to be delayed. So I'm excited about what happens today. And I thank all of my leadership team, Dr. Dawes and, and Marjorie Ja and others who are contributing to this. And of course, the shoulders that we all stand on, Dr. David Satcher. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I look forward to what's next. Thank you so much, Patrick. <clears throat> and Dr. Rice, it's such a pleasure to have you both here. And I feel always inspired by both of your passion and fervor for the equity work that we've taken on together. So we are going to share a feature video now of Shirlane McRae, who's the first lady of New York City. Um, she is a champion of health equity and has been a huge part of our work here that we're privileged to be able to have her support in. Hello, my name is Shirlane McRae, and I am the First Lady of New York City. My pronouns are she and her. When I was growing up, my father used to say, if you have your health, anything is possible. And I agreed with him. But now I add to his words by saying, there is no health without mental health. Because I know the hurt, confusion, and abusive behaviors that accompany substance use disorders and damage individuals and their families. I know the trauma of not being seen and the trauma of being seen and humiliated by verbal assaults, physical assaults. I know the stress, anxiety, and depression. And I am witness to how the mental health challenges of one generation can affect the lives of the children and then the lives of the grandchildren of the next generation. 
Not much pains me more than knowing that tremendous suffering can be made less or prevented with very little. And now, COVID has ripped away a veil of ignorance or unwillingness to see in racism. And we are taking in the full measure of the pandemic and the number of dead bodies, black and brown bodies, grief and economic loss in communities hit without mercy, hit with a physical illness after decades of never truly being served or supported as full citizens. It is not too late. We have an opportunity to move in a different direction, to allocate resources based on need, not equally, but based on need. We can address historical injustices, and we can acknowledge that we cannot have a full recovery from this crisis without mental health equity. That is what we are doing here in New York City. We guarantee health care, including mental health care, to every individual, regardless of their ability to pay. This fall, we're providing a mental health check-in for every student and follow-up mental health services for young people who need them. We are also training more mental health professionals in BIPOC communities, people who speak the languages and know the cultures. Progress is not easy, but nothing worth doing is ever easy. What's important is knowing that this work can be done and that we do this work together. I am grateful to Madhuri Jha, the entire team at the Kennedy Satcher Center and everyone fighting for mental health equity. As a good friend often says, if you want to travel fast, travel alone. If you want to travel far, travel together. Let's seize this moment and travel far together. Thank you. Okay, we are going to take a quick break to set up our panel um, and then we'll get started for panel one of the day. Welcome everyone to our first panel of our second day of our symposium. I want to extend a thank you again to Patrick Kennedy, Dr. Montgomery Rice, and Shirley McRae, First Lady of New York City, for setting such a wonderful tone for the day. We will begin our panel now on cultural humility and sensitivity. Our esteemed panelists will have a roundtable to address how a culturally sensitive approach translates into mental health equity. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce you to our panelists. We first have Dr. Courtney Thomas Tobin, a professor and researcher and medical sociologist from the UCLA Department of Community Health Sciences and African American Studies. She has a breadth of research she has done to look closely at psychological distress in Black Americans. We also have Kayla Tang, who is a licensed practicing psychotherapist here in Atlanta and chief of programming at the Asian Mental Health Collective, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to destigmatizing and normalizing mental health within the AAPI communities. And last but not least, we have Dr. Pierluigi Mancini. Dr. Mancini founded Georgia's only Latino behavioral health program in 1999, and he is a leading national consultant and expert in immigrant and linguistically culturally appropriate behavioral health care in the United States. Welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today for this important discussion. For today, our panelists, I ask you all to think about your role the specific populations you serve and have an interest in working with, and how it translates to mental health equity as we tackle these questions as a group. I encourage you also to channel your own identity in terms of how it influences your work and ability to achieve equitable access for all. A reminder that you can use the raise hand function to be looped into a question that I direct to one of your peers. So if you'd like to provide a follow-up to one of uh, the statements made elsewhere, we'll just have you be able to do a nice round table that way. All right, let's begin. Dr. Mancini, I'm going to start with you for our first question. Given your work as a national consultant, let's start with hearing from you what you see are historical barriers for marginalized folks to be able to readily access behavioral health care. Thank you so much. And, and it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. And, and thanks again to the Kennedy Satcher Institute and Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, 
you know, historically, we've had issues that continue to play. And I think that's the, that's the main problem that I have when, when we talk about the historical aspect of this, because it's something that we've known and it continues to happen. So we're looking at intergenerational health inequities, trauma, oppression, systemic oppression. And like Dr. Montgomery Rice said, we have to look at discrimination, racism, and bias. So for example, we, we have very altered numbers in the criminal justice system, but we know how lopsided the criminal justice system is to people who are black and brown. So yes, we're gonna have more problems there, but it's more of our folks that are in there. In um, racial and ethnic youth um, minorities in, in schools, they have higher rates of being um, kicked out of school or being punished as opposed to um, other groups. And then, you know, what I specialize in, what my world has been the last 25 years is the, the the locks that we have in the access to services for individuals with limited English proficiency and the um, amazing immigrant communities that we have in this country. And just because someone can answer a question in English doesn't mean they're fluent enough to receive services in that question. And unfortunately, we polarized the immigration issue so much that we're losing the fact that the vast majority of immigrants in this country do not have immigration problems, do not have criminal histories, but many of them, about half of them, do have a linguistic barrier and they're not able to access services. Thanks. Excellent, so many excellent points there. And I actually wanna see where, you know, Dr. Thomas Tobin, I'll go to you next, like where your head is going hearing Dr. Mancini's points and, and the research you've done and the work you feel needs to be done to increase access. Thank you. And I'd like to say that I'm also really excited to be here as well. Um, and yeah, Dr. Mancini, you just got me thinking as you were um, sharing some of your thoughts with us. Um, you know, it just really highlights from a research perspective, some of the many challenges that really comes up in our work. Um, you know, particularly for the African-American or the black population and trying to kind of disentangle some of the mental health um, challenges that we face, a lot of it is it's really just so enmeshed in a lot of these other social and community and cultural challenges that as a researcher, it often becomes really difficult to, to try to parse some of that out and to see, you know, where's the best place to intervene and where's the best place to, you know, to really focus our efforts. And so, you know, there's lots of different strategies that I'm sure we're going to talk about today, but that's kind of where, where I've been thinking. Absolutely. And Kayla, to loop you in, you know, statistically, the psych services community has seen an enormous surge in demand from the Asian American community in the last year and a half, especially um, likely due to attention raised around anti-Asian rhetoric and what's been portrayed in our media. You know, in, in your mind, when you hear your colleagues here, what's coming to you about barriers to care in the work that you do? Yeah, um, I just want to echo um, my colleagues and, you know, share their enthusiasm for being here. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and I, do, I, I want to talk about the AA, AAPI community because that's what I know and that's what I specialize in. And so I think obviously in the past couple of years, we've seen a rise in anti-Asian discrimination and violence due to a number of different things, you know, um, COVID um, obviously being one of the obvious ones and also, um, you know, because of this, we've seen an outpouring of need and also support for um, AAPI organizations, especially when it comes to mental health. Um, and speaking to, you know, barriers that uh, maybe prevent a lot of Asians from seeking behavioral health care or, you know, make it more difficult, I, my mind immediately jumps to this model minority myth which is a term many of us have probably heard by now, but you know, it's this idea that a, Asians um, are a monolithic group, which is obviously not the case, um, but that they are also you know, this compliant 
and um, subservient model minority, which is an issue not only for Asians, but also for other minorities because it creates this, um, this hierarchy, I suppose, when it comes to you know, what this model minority uh, looks like. And with that, um, you know, it creates some reasoning that Asians specifically, because they are so successful, which is not always the case, of course, because again, Asians aren't, aren't the mon a monolith, um, that they don't need as much. And that means resources, um, services, any of that, including emotional. So when it comes to mental health care, we don't see as many opportunities for Asians as opposed to other um, other groups, namely whites. So, yeah, you used an important word, um, monolith, which actually came up in both of our panels yesterday too when we're talking about equity. Um, a historic challenge we have with bracketing groups here in the United States. And it stems from data collection challenges we've had nationally. For example, you know, what came up yesterday is the census data we use to develop funding streams and the difficulty we have in being able to accurately depict the diversity of our country. So I want to break this down a little bit as a group. And I appreciate that this is, you know, a smaller group so we can actually tackle this question. Uh, you know, Dr. Thomas Tobin in your research where do you see room for improvement in being able to capture diversity within our communities of color? I hope that question makes sense, but I think I'm, I'm tackling this, this challenge of removing monolithic standards we have to culturally appropriate or responsive care and seeing how we can actually individualize it in a, in a meaningful way. I love that you asked this because we've just been having some of these conversations in our uh, classes here as well. Um, and so, yes, thinking about the heterogeneity or the diversity within populations is so essential. Um, and like you said, I think so much of it comes from, you know, practical challenges, data collection issues, um, you know, and, and the like. And so some of the challenges there um, that we, think about, particularly within the um, African American community and what my work focuses on, um, not only looking at within group ethnic differences, so, you know, um, folks who may be second or even third generation whose parents are not like direct descendants of like the transatlantic slave trade, um, but perhaps maybe they're from the Caribbean and are from, you know, Africa and different countries um, on the continent there. And so, you know, within the U.S., racial categorization system, everybody's just black, you know, or African-American. And it doesn't take into account the, the diversity and experiences and cultural practices and all of the many things that really matters for mental health and, and engagement with the you know, mental health care system. Um, another issue I think that gets really overlooked um, is thinking about socioeconomic status. Um, you know, one of the challenges there is that we often assume that, you know, when folks have higher levels of education or better jobs or income, you know, that access to mental health care isn't an issue um, or engaging in mental health care isn't an issue. However, you know, for African Americans, we see that, you know, a lot of times we see that, you know, it's called the diminishing returns um, hypothesis or status. We see that, you know, that higher level of the socioeconomic resources don't always convey these positive benefits um, when it comes to mental health and health because of the, you know, kind of unique exposures that Black folks face, even with higher levels of education income and, you know, better jobs. And so when it comes to, you know, mental health, um, that often gets overlooked. Um, and folks don't necessarily, again, see them as a risk group or an at-risk group. Um, and that, you know, that becomes very challenging in how we um, try to allocate resources and thinking about, you know, it's not just low income folks that need these efforts and attention. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, in my work, we often keep coming to the inclusion that the conclusion that we have to really target our efforts a bit more. And, you know, it it's a practical challenge because resources are often limited and scarce. And so, you know, but at the end of the day, if we have limited resources, you know, it's my opinion that it's 
best if those resources are more effective than if we're just trying to, you know, tackle everything and it's much less effective. So. Absolutely. And it's making me want to ask you, Dr. Mancini, you founded the first Latino behavioral health organization here and service, service provider here in Georgia. Um, you've been tackling kind of dismantling monoliths for your entire career. You know, I think linguistic appropriateness is really important as well. Um, the boxes that we put ourselves in are very limited. You know, Kayla and I are both technically Asian, but my type of South Asian, as we noted yesterday, didn't exist on the census until 2010. Um, and there are hundreds of cultures that are represented in the groups we have here. What is coming to you in terms of being able to break down some of those limitations that we see, you know, in our efforts to standardize care? Thank you so much. And, you know, when I began this work, um, one of the biggest barriers that I encountered was that the lack of information that was available in order to educate uh, individuals, whether they were funders or organizations or even state agencies, and all the way to the federal level. And what I found was that persistence is the key. So, you know, government moves very slow anytime we need to um, suggest any kind of policy change, whether it's local, state, or federal, it moves extremely slow. So when I first started, uh, the challenges was that people did not want to support <clears throat> what I was doing because there were no outcome studies on the benefit of linguistic appropriate, linguistically responsive services. And there were only a couple of, of Latino researchers back in 1999 that were doing this kind of work. So it was very limited. But the more that we push on, the more that we press on, we, we need to identify those heroes that will keep us doing that. You know, over the course of about 15 years, we were able to develop a, our own bilingual workforce. We supported uh, students that became licensed clinicians. We were able to serve over 150 people per day in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So success can happen, but we need to be able to understand what are the nuances, what are those key issues. And in order to do that, we have to stay connected in the communities. What I found when I started is the Hispanic Latino community didn't know what a therapist, a clinician, a psychologist was. And those that knew wanted to stay as far away from them because they didn't want to be called crazy. They didn't want to be set aside because what is normal, if I hate that word, but in, in most of those communities is you hide your family members that have a behavioral health issue. You hide them from you. You, you don't want people to see them because it brings embarrassment to the family. Now, <clears throat> to put that into scale, you know, the, the latest census figures put Hispanics in this country about 60 and a half million people, um, 18 and a half percent of the population. And we have about 10 million, about 17% of, of Hispanics report that they're having some serious issues. And that number doesn't really include some of the specialty groups that if we don't do something about now, I mean, we're really late, but if we don't do something about now, we're gonna lose them for life. I'm talking about the, the kids at the border um, that are having tremendous uh, traumatic issues every day. And the DACA population, these kids in limbo who have given their life to this country and they still, fear they may get kicked out tomorrow. So um, persistence and, and having those heroes among us to be able to move forward, we're able to, um, to do this. And for that, we need to be educated and we need to continue to develop the solutions. And I know we're gonna talk about those in a bit. Thank Absolutely. You. There's so many wonderful points you just brought up. One of the things that's coming to mind on your statement is around what an affirming workforce or an affirming space means for communities that have carried a lot of stigma and shame for otherness that they've experienced, right? So not just racial or ethnic identity, this is also affecting the disability community, folks in the LGBTQ plus community. 
um, feeling like the space that they're accessing services are welcoming and affirming and appreciative of their identity as, as how they carry it. Kayla, you identify as an affirming psychotherapist. You know, tell us our tell our audience what that means to you, um, and why that's important in the work that you do. So, what I think that means is being inclusive above anything else, being inclusive, respectful um, of all identities, all intersectionalities. Um, and I think what I find to be very important when it comes to working with different minority populations is the um, vulnerability and humility it takes to ask if you don't know something. And I think this is so important because I've been in conversations where I've heard from people that they are very scared to ask because they're worried that they might come off as um, being racist or something if they don't share a cultural background or something with someone else that they're working with. So when it comes to working in um, inclusive spaces, I really think that, um, you know, having the knowledge, having the self-knowledge of maybe implicit biases that one carries especially is important because um, if you don't know yourself, then you are not going to be aware of how you're going to impact the people that you serve, the people that you work with. And I, I think that there is so much need for open dialogue in terms of, you know, these different um, identities and what that means and how others can support these communities. Um, yeah, and, and what you're bringing up too is the power of language, I think, um, right? So, you know, as a clinician, one of the things, and, and we, we commented on this yesterday as a group, so I love that some of these themes are just carrying over into all of our panels, which means that this is really the right conversation to be having. But as a clinician, when, I, when I've worked with, you know, let's say teenagers age 13 to 16, for example, the beauty that I see in the generation of kiddos coming up now is the means by which they have to identify themselves, uh, you know, in terms of language choice, how they can come to terms with things at a, at a younger age because they're validated by ways to be able to identify, which is hugely important for their own psychosocial wellness, right? Their ability to feel affirmed in their world that they live in. Dr. Thomas Tobin, we're also talking about workforce here, right? And, and sort of what works to bring someone to a space, you know, to make it inviting. And your work has looked a lot at this, I think, too, in terms of institutional reasons why the Black community feels averse to accessing healthcare in general. What do you think works, you know, and, and what are some meaningful exercises you've seen that have worked to be able to kind of bridge this gap? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with some of the things that Kayla was mentioning. Um, you know, so much of it, it always is this tension between like the structural barriers and constraints and um, versus what individual folks can do, right? Um, and so when we think about, you know, tackling challenges like institutional racism and bias and, you know, um, there are definitely kind of policy things that we can do. We can implement education. We can do things like that. Um, but, you know, as someone, you know, who often thinks about some of those psychosocial factors, I'm often asked about, like, what can I do as an individual? And it, I think it definitely does come to one, I really love the idea of um, asking, you know, because again, I think so much of it at the individual level has to do with kind of this lack of knowledge, lack of education about people, you know, you know, folks are in their communities and their silos and when you don't come into contact with other folks, you know, a lot of times that's where a lot of the barriers come in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also kind of thinking outside of the box, um, you know, when we think about some of the common things that folks say, like Dr. Mancini mentioned, um, like, you know, I don't go to therapy or I've heard people say, I don't believe in therapy or, you know, there's a range of things like that, right? Um, and over the years, I'm like, I firmly believe that you really just have to meet people where they are. Um, 
And as practitioners and researchers, it's like, we often know, you know, we can, we know we, the evidence of things that can work, but, you know, you have to be able to adapt it in a way that kind of, again, meets people where they are. So, you know, you may not get folks to come and sit down with you one-on-one -on -one in a traditional looking therapy session, you know, how folks imagine sitting on the therapist couch and that kind of thing. That's not going to happen for a lot of people, you know, but there, I think, are more and more really creative and innovative ways that folks are adapting those spaces to be, you know, to be open and inclusive and using the, the resources that are already within communities, I think is really the valuable part. So, um, for example, there's lots of work now looking at um, how, like, churches, you know, can become these spaces um, you know, uh, ministries can, you know, there's mental health ministries and folks are really open to that, you know, because again, you're not framing it as like, oh, you're crazy or you have, you know, these issues, but it's really just emphasizing the need to talk to someone and, you know, and those lay ministry workers have the knowledge, you know, because they, they work with, you know, practitioners and other folks um, and are trained and they have the knowledge to then, you know, they can refer folks that may need more serious help, but then they're also, you know, helping people, you know, and reducing a lot of that distress that's, you know, really plaguing the community. Um, like, you know, and there's also similar like barbershop interventions and kind of things like that to, to get at, you know, hard to reach populations like black men, you know, or notoriously, you know, averse to, um, kind of that individual therapy sessions. But again, if you meet people where they are, literally and figuratively, like meet them in those spaces. And then I think it becomes possible to kind of meld the intentions of those spaces to make it um, really effective in, in a way that really improves outcomes. You bring up such a, a wonderful set of examples too of what community-centric care means. So yeah, that's, that was yet another theme of yesterday of community-centric care. So we often talk about patient-centered care, which is the gold standard. But community-centric centric care, when we talk about equity and communities that haven't had ready, ready access or even the affordability to think this is a solution that I can experience also speaks to trauma, which I think we can't have a discussion on cultural humility and sensitivity without talking about it. Um, they're trauma-informed whatever blanket label you want to put after that. So trauma-informed care, trauma-informed policy, trauma-informed data has become something that people talk about a lot. One of the things I feel is that a lot of communities of color and communities that have been marginalized uh, is that if, for example, we are to speak about the traumas we go through, it's a terrifying experience too. It's a true exercise in courage to be able to say that the institutional trauma and legacy of my people here is something that I live in a reality today, right? And that's a way that a mentor of mine phrased it. The concept of trauma-informed care, I want us to talk about, you know, um, Dr. Mancini, what does that concept mean to you? How do you imagine that being meaningful and effective? And again, not going back to being monolithic, that trauma-informed care works for everyone, um, but rather can be an actual exercise and courage that we give to people. Thank you. Um, it's something very interesting because I, I see it as a dichotomy. I see it as, as the, the perspective of the clinician, of the researcher, um, because if we don't start with ourselves, it's gonna be extremely difficult for us to be efficient, for us to be able to help a community or help an individual. And investing in ourselves, it has to be a lifelong um, commitment. You know, often what happens is individuals get a two hour training a year on cultural competence and they put a check mark. It's like, okay, we did that. We're gonna pass our inspection, right? But there is no actual commitment, right? So we have to make sure that we have that and we have to start with our own trauma whatever it was, you know, whatever cleanup we need to do within ourselves in our lives. And some people will have minimal or, or none even, but then some people will have very serious um, events in their past that are, are dictating where they head. And when we look at a community, 
there are also different levels of, of trauma in the community. You know, horrific events like, you know, in Atlanta, what happened in the Asian community. Um, more recently, this past weekend, there was a horrific event in the Hispanic community. Um, and that's trauma, not only for that family, but for that city, because all of a sudden they're exposed. They're all over the country being talked about this horrific thing that happened. And if we don't have some kind of framework, some kind of foundation within that community, if people don't know, where can I go? You know, when I'm feeling this way, when I just witnessed something or read something and it triggered, I've had people that are watching that news story and they're feeling triggered and they're reaching out through social media. Where do I go? Who do I call? And that's part of, of how a community needs to be responsive. And it's not just a toll-free number or a text number. We have to remember we have individuals that may not know how to use those. And we need to make it as simple and as easy as possible for people to work. The work in the communities needs to be boots on the ground. We need to make sure that we have individuals within that city, within that town, that people know they can go to. Because in, in smaller communities, like immigrant communities are very tight. They need to know who they can go to that they trust. Not someone that's gonna go gossip about every other immigrant in there about, oh, did you hear what happened to Pierre Luigi? No, it's someone that they feel they can trust. So it has to be boots on the ground. It has to be localized and it has to be delivered in a way that that individual can understand and can access. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm seeing our, our peers here in our group just who are all going like this. And I wanna remind our panelists, we are still trying to get this chat function to work. I am not sure in this Zoom world, we can't always get things to work. But if you have a question for us, we really welcome it. Kennedy Satcher at msm.edu. We have a team that's checking those that we can include your comments in this. Kayla, you founded the Asian Mental Asian American Mental Health Collective with your peers. You know, I think for me, it feels like it was in direct response to a lot of the things Dr. Mancini is is communicating on. You know, tell us about your inspiration behind that and and what's been working for you and your reasons for doing creating a space like that where you can have a directory of therapists that people can go to. You know, and and feel that they have trust in a space that's readily available. Yeah, so um, Asian Mental Health Collective, AMHC for short, um, is a recently founded 501c3. So we founded this actually in November of last year. And originally it stemmed from some grassroots initiatives, one being a Facebook group actually called Subtle Asian Mental Health that was meant to provide an online space for Asian folks to share about their mental health struggles, any of the experiences they've had, because especially in the wake of COVID, so much, so many of us have been, you know, forced to quarantine. We feel very isolated and alone. So we've seen that there are, you know, such a large number of folks turning to the internet, turning to virtual spaces to connect with community. And I think, um, you know, things such as subtle Asian mental health um, online spaces that AMHC offers has been so instrumental in being able to provide these safe spaces where minority folks, Asian folks in particular, can go to um, feel that they can be in a, in a, in a community that they can trust and relate to, especially um, following the Atlanta shootings, I mean, I myself uh, was having a very hard time just processing what had happened. I mean, I live 10 minutes away from one of the spas. Um, and for me, um, I wanted to shut myself off to the rest of the world and just be with my community um, in the days following that. And I found it to be so healing and I know that some of my, you know, Asian peers also found that to be incredibly helpful. And I think that so many of us get wrapped in this idea that, you know, we need to find solutions and help um, by pop communities in any way that we can, which is great. But we also need to respect that 
sometimes we need our own space too. Um, and AMHC has, you know, tried to further our mission of destigmatizing mental health by creating services and programs um, such as community support groups, um, the therapist directory that, you know, lists Asian providers in every state, also in Canada, so that it makes the search for, you know, um, a provider who shares in your cultural background much more easy because we really didn't see that before. Um, and we were the first ones to say, hey, I think this is really important because what we're seeing in our Facebook group is a lot of people aren't finding providers who can really get where they're coming from, who can't connect culturally. And this is such a large component of our own identities. And so um, at AMHC, at least, we really try to cater to our community by first uplifting the voices of, you know, of folks who we serve, but also by supporting Asian, specifically Asian providers, because we know that there is such a lack of representation within the mental health field when it comes to BIPOC. I think, I think that's something that's just come up is in, in workforce, you know, there just has to be a more concerted effort as well to give pathways to education for folks of color uh, to become clinical professionals and healing professionals and researchers to be able to be representative of the experiences that we have. But I also do want to talk about what meaningful collaboration and allyship means. I think these are terms that in the equity movement we hear a lot. Um, but I'm not sure we really thoughtfully talk about what that is. You know, a lot of our part of our participants who identify as white want to know, you know, what is meaningful collaboration? What is true allyship? And I think that that's something that we can provide a space here to talk through what works and what doesn't. Um, so Dr. Thomas Tobin, you, you mentioned some great community partnerships that can be there. What's coming to mind to you too for other types of meaningful collaboration that can be part of this conversation? What a great question. I feel like this comes up a lot um, as a researcher um, because again, you know, folks have often the best intentions and they want to help and they maybe have resources or a grant and they don't necessarily have like a connection to a particular community. Um, and someone recently mentioned to me kind of making that distinction between even like CDPR or community-based participatory research versus like community partnered participatory research, um, really emphasizing that to make these efforts really work and to make them effective and to make them equitable, um, what's necessary is that the community and the academy or whoever is you know running um, the efforts, and even that, it shouldn't be them running the efforts, it should be a, a real collaboration. And I think starting with that as the foundation um, to any efforts is really what um, it takes to, to be an ally um, and to, you know, not just include folks of color in your work, but to make their, to make their voice the expert voice and the focus. And so I think that often gets lost, um, you know, from a research standpoint. Um, because, you know, a lot of times we go in uh, to a community and we, we want to, we, we have our understanding of how things work. Um, but a big part of it, um, and it's even like Kayla mentioned in thinking of, um, you know, as practitioners, you know, it's just as researchers, we also have to kind of think about our own biases and think about kind of what we're bringing to the table and how that's playing a role in shaping um, these interactions. And so for folks who want to be true allies, um, oftentimes I think that means like taking yourself out of the equation and being willing to listen and to um, like do the work as directed by other folks, which is not always easy to do. Um, but you know, I think that's really what it takes um, to really make a difference and to do it in an equitable way that is not going to re-traumatize people. So I think that's really essential. 
And such a subtle shift in, in word choice there that carries so much power, right? You said community-based, shifting that from community-based to community-partnered mm -hmm. research, right? And, and how much more weight being in a partnership can really carry. I love that. Dr. Mancini, you know, meaningful collaboration. You you are such a networked individual. You do so much work in in your field. You know, what works for you? What have you seen been done really well in your career? Uh, thank you so much. So you know, there is. We have to acknowledge that meaningful collaboration is not random, right? We need to be able to be focused and and to know where we, where it is that we want to go. And it's usually something significant that we want to accomplish. And it, it exists at different levels. So I approach them depending on, on what the level is. You know, there's the practitioner level. We've had, you know, many good collaborations with practitioners that have other specialties that maybe our clinic didn't offer. And all that did was improve that client's ability to reach that goal of living a healthy, happy life. Uh, and continuing back to functionality. But then there is organizational allyship. And I think that's where sometimes um, you know, we, we get in trouble. There are some organizations that tend to be very territorial and there are others that tend to be very open. And one of the best places where I'm seeing this, um, uh, this purpose collaboration is in integrated care. So, you know, we, we heard um, a couple of people have mentioned there is no health without mental health, but we had silos, we separate them, right? Your psychiatrist is here and you, your orthopedic surgeon is here and then your dentist is, right? But we, we cannot have one without the other. So we're seeing very successful collaborations of, for example, primary care physicians that are hiring care managers and even clinicians to be in their office. I, I, I see my doctor once a year for my physical, you know, thank God. Um, but he hired a social worker. So now there is someone in his office that he, if, while he's doing an interview with, with his patient, something comes up that says, oh, wait a minute, this is a red flag. Would you mind talking to my social worker for a few minutes? Instant. Right, you don't have to wait three weeks or three months. And then the other way around, if you have a behavioral health organization and you bring in a, whether it's a partner or your own primary care site on site and, and dental, we can't forget about dental, um, it's also yielding amazing results. So we, we have those kinds of partnerships um, and I call those external, right? But then there's the ally, allyship and the meaningful collaboration within communities. Now, unfortunately, in some communities, and I know in the Latino community, sometimes it happens, um, people don't want to play together, right? And, and that takes some finessing. It takes some work. It takes some give and take. And the key to that is understanding each other and making sure that we um, bring the language, which I know you highlighted already in, in this uh, session, the language that is non-threatening so that person understands that the ultimate goal is to help this individual return to functionality in a way that they can enjoy life. Um, so I do see a, a great role for this. I don't think we can do it by ourselves. Uh, we need to have partners. We need to have people. And, um, you know, I'll take this opportunity to, to tell Ms. Tang, I love what you guys did with the directory. I was talking to a reporter the other day and, and you, your directory came up and I said, yes, they've done an amazing job and, and, and I love the way it's working. So thank you. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. But I think also you brought up an excellent point here too. I think that carries us back to stigma, which is, so I know in my work, I have found, especially in immigrant communities in my own culture, the doctor is seen as the authority on wellness and healing, for example. Um, and seeing you all nod, it sounds like this is similar that you've experienced too. And so creating a, a pathway where a, a primary care physician, for example, can house behavioral health access within there can create so much normalization of, yeah, you can't have one without the other. This is part of that process. I think it's an excellent 
strategy we can give to our participants to hear. We have a whole variety of participants who've joined. We have some clinical professionals, students, agency directors, legislators, and these are the kinds of things I think people really need to hear. Um, but Kayla, I want this question, you know, also to go to you about allyship and meaningful collaboration, especially, you know, thinking through how there is such a demand now for culturally responsive care. And you're right, we don't have a workforce that can meet that demand. So what comes to you in terms of what could work? Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. First, that, um, you know, oftentimes different minority groups are pitted against each other, which I think is very unfortunate, but of course, you know, dates back several decades and again, kind of creates this um, hierarchy. <laughs> um, just referring back to the model mi myth minority or model minority myth, sorry. Um, but I think it's important to understand that when you support and uplift one minority group, you're supporting and uplifting a whole bunch of minority groups too. Um, and that is important because in terms of, you know, working together, I think it's not just a matter of reaching in your own community and helping out, you know, those in need, but you're also looking to other communities, other minority groups, um, people of, you know, a variety of intersectionalities, we're wanting to support everyone because all, you know, all, all voices should be heard essentially. Um, and the other thing, and I've seen this kind of also in the wake of the Atlanta shootings is that when something very traumatic happens, especially if, if it makes, you know, national news, um, people are very quick to rush to your side, but that doesn't mean that they're always going to be there. Um, and so when it comes to trying to find something that you want to support, um, you know, ask yourself if you're in it for the long haul, do you really mean that you want to support this cause or support this community? Um, you know, I think it's, often scary when there's something um, big that occurs that might um, be difficult to sort of ride out, but understand that this is the moment, these are the moments when we really need your help. And so it's not just, you know, a matter of donating $5 after some after, after a tragedy strikes, it's a matter of learning how to keep this support sustainable. Um, and, you know, whether that is on the micro level or the macro level, you know, any, anything is meaningful, anything helps. Um, but if you're intentional um, about reaching out and being an ally, I think, you know, it really takes some thought and action into, okay, so how do I make sure that um, I'm able to be there for more than just um, a one-off incident? I think this is a, an excellent segue to, you know, we can't have any of the discussions we're having over the past two days without talking about how the last year and a half has changed all of us um, and changed the way we speak about equity. Equity has now become a buzzword. So, you know, we had this pandemic uh, of COVID-19. We have had a long-standing hundred years pandemic of discrimination and oppression that really came to the forefront. You know, what was highlighted yesterday too is the fact that folks were so isolated and at home, it was just on your TV screen. And this phenomenon, you know, it was one incident after another that comes forward that people then have an attention limit for, you know? And so I want to open this discussion to all of you, you know, how the last year and a half has really changed the way you see your work and your role and where can we go from here in terms of points of urgency? You know, what can we tell our participants about what's really important now? But anybody who wants to go first, um, maybe Dr. Mancini, I'll, I'll take it to you. Thank you so much. Um, so it's been a very interesting period for all of us. Um, and I think it really says a lot about um, our, our community, our country in general, right? Because we're seeing things that um, it began by numbers coming out that the um, 
numbers for people suffering from anxiety and depression skyrocketed 30, 40, 50%. Um, suicide ideation and suicide completion skyrocketed. Um, but at the same time, we saw uh, cities, counties, uh, states changing legislation so we can bring alcohol to your home, right? So we can deliver alcohol. So you can walk out of the restaurant with the rest of your bottle with things that you couldn't do before. So we saw sales of alcohol go up as high as 500% in some areas of the country. So it really showed us that, you know, as much as we try, we still have a ways to go to help people understand how to manage emotions, how to manage stress in a healthy way. Um, I'm not saying that is, you know, some people can have a drink when, you know, every once in a while, but if you're using alcohol and drugs to medicate what we've going through the last year and a half, we have a problem. And yeah. it's being shown even with the 30% increase of overdoses from opioids since the pandemic started. So I, I have that. Now, challenges come with that. So we have more people that are realizing they have a problem or that they're suffering or they're going through a difficult time and they're asking for help. And we have less number of clinicians available. So we have clinicians leaving the field because of compassion fatigue and burnout. And we have those that were already planning on retiring, retiring, and we don't have enough in the pipeline to come in. And when it comes to my world, when you talk about bilingual, bicultural clinicians, it's been extremely difficult to continue to attract um, Latinos to come into this field for a couple of reasons. It is a field that is still not very much understood in the community as a career. You know, and you hear things like, you, you know, the opposite of, of what you said about a doctor. In Latino communities, you hear it's like, oh, a psychologist, oh no, that's not a doctor. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, a, a clinician, oh no, no, they're not, they're not uh, medical. So that perspective needs to change. But then we also have uh, the mirroring you know, for minorities in this country, between three and 5% of Asian, African-American and Latino are um, members of a licensed um, psychologist or social work community. So those are very dismal numbers. So if you don't see people that look like you providing that work, we don't have that incentive. And the last one I would say is, is the, um, the economics. So we need to increase the workforce but we need to make sure that people can pay for this. So, you know, we could look at things that are used in other professions, like loan forgiveness. If you work with people that speak other languages or, or work in a geographic area that desperately needs you. So I think the pandemic has shown, has shown us many things, but it's put a huge magnifying glass in mm -hmm. disparities when it comes to race and ethnicity and in the need that we have to come together and continue to work on the solutions. What a great suggestion too about incentives to try and make our workforce more improved. And, and we can't leave, you know, native and tribal folks out of this conversation. You know, we've made an effort throughout this whole symposium to as well acknowledge that the numbers are dismal for communities of color. They're practically non-existent for folks in tribal communities to have a pathway to education and yet their numbers are so off the charts in terms of disparity and trauma historically and also reality-based um, experience that it, there's something that needs to be made better. Um, Dr. Dr. Thomas Tobin, for you, you know, what has transformed in your work? I, are you seeing things differently in the way that you wanna approach your research moving forward? Definitely, um, and thinking about some of the things you mentioned just now, Dr. Mancini, um, I think not only has the pandemic really, you know, emphasized or magnified a lot of the challenges that, you know, communities are already facing, but, you know, on the positive side, I think it has also kind of shown us a few avenues of, you know, opportunities um, in terms of, you know, we have switched to this new virtual world, you know, and in so many ways, um, folks who perhaps, you know, didn't engage in, internet use or social media, you know, I think of a lot of older folks who, um, you know, even think of my parents, you know, they are kind of technologically challenged, but, you know, they, you know, have started using, you know, Zoom on their phone and um, being able to like go to a Bible study or, you know, doing telehealth visits and, you know, so in some ways I think about those um, strategies as 
kind of new approaches and to help us to increase access to a lot of uh, resources. But then also kind of at the grassroots level, um, you know, we've been thinking about how folks have really, you know, tried to stay connected via like social media. And, you know, in some ways that can definitely be troublesome and it can, you know, be, uh, it can cause a lot of additional stress. Um, but I think from a public health standpoint, we can also kind of use that to reach groups and communities that we would never really have access to before. Um, and to, you know, I think of all the like TikTok videos out there, um, these kind of short form, you know, public health messages that are really increasing. Um, you know, there's been all this research recently about how, you know, uh, doctors have used TikTok to kind of dispel myths about, you know, um, the pandemic, about COVID-19 and about the need to wear a mask and even things like that. And so, you know, and thinking about how um, folks have used that to really improve, um, you know, mental health care, mental health access. Um, if you look, there's really been a lot of videos um, that's kind of like, you know, using that community health worker approach, but trying to reach people that way. Um, so I think, you know, I'm hopeful that we can get something good out of, you know, this very almost two year experience now too. So I'm hoping that, you know, this can really also be an opportunity for us to tackle all of these, you know, inequities in some new and innovative ways. Absolutely. I, I think also the that type of urgency has been communicated across the board yesterday and today, you know, that if we don't capitalize on this momentum now, the energy that we have and be very thoughtful about it, we're only setting ourselves up to fail for the next whatever global catastrophe there is that comes forward in the world we live in now. And we have a real opportunity here to create a system that has a foundation that's very strong, very equitable. Kayla, I don't want to leave you out of this too. What's transformed for you? Obviously, your work has has changed a lot. I know you've told me personally in the last year and a half, but you know, where do you see points of urgency and and what do you envision for the future? Yeah, um, I think obviously the past year and a half has been pretty momentous for the Asian community. Um, I think about how we're just starting to see some sort of representation in the media for AAPI, and I think that's great. However, I would also you know, love to see representation of all Asians, um, all ethnicities. Um, and I think this is so important because you know, when we are just focusing on a very small, um, small part of the Asian community as a whole, um, we can often come across, you know, um, a lack of um, understanding um, and we're suppressing voices that need to be heard because obviously, you know, not everyone will have the same experience, um, you know, speaking to even the way that people um, find their ways to America, immigration, um, whether that's through, you know, fleeing country because it's war torn um, or being born here. I mean, there are so many different experiences that I feel are left out um, because of, you know, just a, a, a a lack of, of education. And when it comes to, um, you know, mental health specifically, I have heard a lot today in our conversation about the need for more um, diversity in our workforce. And I think, um, you know, some barriers to uh, that prevent people from entering mental health specifically um, often comes down to uh, funding too, right? And if we're able to create more, you know, scholarship opportunities, um, Dr. Mancini um, mentioned, you know, the, the, loan, the loan program, which is great for service workers, um, but not only in education, but also in therapy, um, I think it makes it a lot more accessible to people in general and something that we recently created at AMHC was 
our subsidized therapy program. So we're able to take some of our funds and offer free sessions to our community members who would otherwise not be able to um, see a therapist to receive any help. And um, this is a huge deal because of, again, we talked about the stigma, but sometimes people don't feel comfortable going to their own family members because of the shame of mental health. And so if we're able to you know, understand these issues and find ways to um, help make services uh, more easily available, then I think that would be a huge, a huge win. Absolutely. Affordability and accessibility, you know, I think are, are two key words there. We have one question that's come through. Um, it is actually for Dr. Mancini. So this will be, you know, the last question of the day. It's just a comment in your perspective on the urban rural divide to, you know, to not leave that discussion off the table, you know, in terms of what makes equitable access, you know, what we need to do to ensure rural communities are equally resourced and given the opportunities that urban ones have. Thank you so much for that question. It is imperative that we reach out to rural communities. Uh, in the state of Georgia, for example, there are entire counties that do not have a single clinician at any level. And people, a lot of them don't have transportation, need to figure out a way how to travel one or two counties. And then yes, telecounseling came through and it brought us great benefits during the pandemic, but there are parts in rural Georgia where you cannot have internet access. There is no bandwidth. And even your phone, depending on what uh, phone company you have, there are dead spots. So you can't even have a telephonic uh, consultation. And of course, those are all um, fine. They work for many people, but not for all people. There is still a lot of people that are going to need that individual face-to-face -face contact in order for us uh, to be helpful. So again, there are solutions for these counties. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of schools in Georgia that that train clinicians. I think there could be partnerships between those counties and those schools, and maybe they they you know we've also put out there there is a mobile mammograms. Why can't we have mobile counseling? and have the, the, you know, the car or the bus come by um, every so often. And then there is, um, you know, places within communities that again, the community, I think Dr. Thomas Tobin mentioned the barbershops, those exist and, and they exist in rural communities and we have to learn how to use them along with the faith community. Um, the faith community can be, again, it's one of those areas where if we use the right language we can provide people counseling and they don't know that this is what counseling is, right? right? They won't know they're receiving mental health services because they're getting it through someone they trust in a way that they understand uh, uh, differently. So it is imperative. And it's not just the state of Georgia. That's just where I live. And I love the state of Georgia. Uh, it's all over the country. We see the same issues pop up all over the country. And then uh, immigrant communities in every state. Uh, Georgia has over 1 million foreign born individuals. Half of them have limited English proficiency and um, they don't all live in the metro area. So we also have to make sure that we have access linguistically to um, services in rural areas as well. Thanks. Wow. Um, I hate that we're out of time because I, my big feeling is I think we need to just devote larger moments to be able to come together and talk about all of these issues. Um, but we are out of time for this first panel of the day. I want to thank all of you so sincerely for not only being open, but you know, you chose to share about your own experiences as well as people of color and what your work means to you. And that openness and that respect between you, I hope carries through to our participants as well to know what they can do in their own work. We all have a reason why we're here. Um, we don't choose to enter public health or behavioral health work without a personal journey that we've come to be a part of. So I thank you so, so much for being a part of this and taking time to be in our discussion. And to our participants, we are going to take a short break here for lunch and to set up for our amazing keynotes. Our two keynotes today, we will be hearing first from Senator Richard Pan from California, who is also a pediatrician of Asian descent and has been a huge champion for health equity in his entire career. 
And then he will be followed up by one of our most leading native health researchers of Pawnee Nation, Abigail Echohawk, who will conclude our, our afternoon with a presentation. So I really hope you all will come back to listen to these fantastic presentations at 1 Eastern time. Thank you so much. Enjoy the little break and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you.